and welcome to the show. I'm your host, Lynn Weaver, and you're watching In the Studio. The show, the program, is brought to you by Davis Media Access and it's broadcast on Davis Community Television, that's Comcast Channel 15 and uh, AT&T UVerse 99. We're also on the web, uh, so at uh, uh, davismedia.org, uh, so log on and check us out. My guests today are three prominent UC Davis scientists, uh, Professor Arnold Broom of the Department of Plant Sciences, mm -hmm. uh, Professor and Extension Specialist Louise Jackson of the Department of Land, Air and Water Resources, and uh, Professor and Extension Specialist uh, uh, Frank Mitlerner of the Department of Animal Sciences. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for being here with us tonight and we appreciate your time and your commitment to the community. Our topic today is climate smart agriculture. Scientists have known for many decades of the effects of uh, carbon emissions and uh, other human intervention have had on uh, global warming and uh, uh, the greenhouse effect on the earth, but it wasn't until uh, Al Gore uh, released his documentary uh, The In Inconvenient Truth in 2006 that the international public uh, became keenly aware of the devastating consequences of uh, uh, global warming and begin to, we began to uh, worry about it. Um, so uh, nowadays it's becoming clearer uh, that uh, it's becoming clearer that uh, uh, we may never stop climate change however uh, we can if we're prudent in our policies uh, we can uh, certainly uh, slow it down and mitigate uh, the uh, reality of a warming earth so the question is no longer whether Santa Claus will be wearing a swimsuit in the future, but whether we'll be able to adapt in order to survive. Now agriculture, livestock and plant production uh, is extremely vulnerable to climate change. Uh, populations in the developing world uh, are particularly at risk. Uh, they are very vulnerable and food insecure because of the um, the lack of uh, clean water, uh, the lack of uh, uh, resources, education, uh, food safety and other predicaments uh, such as wars and extreme poverty. So they are likely to be suffering the most uh, from uh, uh, global warming. Uh, but we all will and our livelihood depends on it. Uh, so um, we are counting on scientists like yourselves, on uh, policy makers and uh, on farmers uh, to find ways uh, to, uh, to find ways and uh, recommend some actions that uh, will uh, mitigate uh, the climate change and uh, at the same time continue to ensure uh, the increasing need for food and sustainability. So um, how are we going to do that? Uh, well, um, first, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Louise Jackson, uh, what is climate smart agriculture? Can you give us your thoughts on that? Climate smart agriculture is um, a term that's coined to look at how agriculture can respond to climate change in a myriad of different ways from many different perspectives. We know that we need to increase productivity, increase food production just to meet the needs of um, 9 billion people in 2050. We have to do it in a way that uses more renewable resources, that's less demanding of fossil fuels, um, that reduces the greenhouse gas emissions that are contributing to um, climate change. Some of the solutions to this can be very technological they can be things that um, people may um, learn about different soil and biological processes. They may have to do with um, risk management and um, insurance and ways that farmers can be 
um, compensated for losses or um, things that um, might happen in the future that we can't even predict. But at the same time, climate smart agriculture has to be targeted at the resource base upon which agriculture depends. Water, water quality, soil, soil quality, um, ways that we um, look at the mosaic of ecosystems in a landscape so that we um, can preserve the biodiversity that may be, say, in uplands that's protecting the watershed. We have to also include aspects of human populations and the risk that um, severe climate change can result in um, rural populations migrating to urban areas and being rather um, destitute when they arrive there. Well, that's a very interesting point. Uh, uh, would you like to uh, comment on uh, what uh, uh, climate smart uh, agriculture is for you? Or how do you see it? Well, we uh, feel that there are quite some changes occurring over the last couple of decades, uh, particularly in the area of animal agriculture. And um, some of it has to do with climate variability that we find. I'll give you one example. Just a few years back, yes. in the summer, uh, two or three years ago, we had an event occurring here in the San Joaquin Valley of California where 30,000 dairy cows died throughout a one-week period. And uh, the question was why? Well, um, because we now have climate events or weather events occurring that were pretty atypical before, where you have hot daytime temperatures and hot nighttime temperatures as well. Animals don't recover from it and therefore um, fall, fall over from heat stroke. So we have more and more of these events and a, a chain of many events really leading toward us thinking, well, there is indeed climate change occurring, not just weather variability. And it really uh, harms animal agriculture pretty severely. Another example is what we currently experience with respect to feed supply for livestock. Never has feed been more expensive and the reason why it's so expensive is because we're going from one drought to another. Not just in California, That's but throughout the United States. Yeah, so it's all correlated, yes. yes. Um, uh, would you say, um, Arnold, mm -hmm. <laughs> Arnold Bloom, would you say that uh, uh, in a way uh, climate smart uh, agriculture is adaptation to certain uh, environmental conditions? Well, climate smart involves both mitigation and adaptation. Those terms are used in a way that mitigation is to try to make lessen the impact of uh, what's happening. And adaptation is changes people can make to changes that they cannot prevent from happening. Mm -hmm. So you can mitigate greenhouse gas by reducing the emissions of it, or you can uh, do something to adapt to the changes those emissions might cause. So the major things that we're concerned with uh, are temperature changes, which are clearly going to have an impact on all organisms. And they may be as anticipated by the end of the century, we may have temperature changes on the order of about 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh, that's... And that uh, precipitation is a little less certain, but uh, the, the, we anticipate that the drier places on the planet will become drier and the wetter places will become wetter. In specific, California being one of the drier places, we'll probably see a decrease in rainfall of about uh, 10 to 20 percent. And uh, particularly in this area, everybody's aware of uh, water issues. And as such, if uh, we're, we now have a 10 to 20 percent decline in rainfall, everybody can see how they'll affect not just urban areas, but uh, agricultural areas. Especially in the West. Correct. Um, uh, by the way, feel free to jump in anytime. Mm -hmm. I want this to be a very uh, informative discussion and everybody should participate. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, wanted to, uh, I wanted to stay with you, uh, Arnold, and ask you how does climate change impact today's conventional uh, agriculture? And we're going to start with our region and perhaps uh, then uh, um, Frank is going to expand that maybe to uh, a more uh, for, to, for, the, for the rest of the world, perhaps give us a, a bit of an overview. But uh, so for this region, what for would you say? Region, uh, to promote plants, since my last name is Bloom, I, I tend to be uh, <laughs> uh, plant-oriented. Uh, well, your plants are very healthy, right? Yeah, they bloom all the time. Uh, yes, they do. <laughs> 
Uh, but uh, plants are very vulnerable in ways that animals are not to the anticipated changes. One is that uh, carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere are increasing and they've done that during my lifetime in about 40% since I started working in this field. It's anticipated they'll go up uh, double or triple by the end of the century. And plants, but not animals, are very sensitive to that increase in CO2 because it's part of their process of photosynthesis where they take that carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and convert it into carbohydrates, into sugars. That's their process of photosynthesis where uh, all energy on the planet, uh, most of the energy on the planet derives from that. So as CO2 increases, it was thought that that would be a boon to plant productivity, but it has not proved to be so. And that's fact, very interesting, yes. And that's sort of where my research lies, is that, uh, that that increase in CO2 often leads to a decline in food quality. The amount of protein that's available in plants today has declined because of that rising CO2. And we seem to find that CO2 interferes with the ability of plants to take nutrients from the soil and convert them into protein in their tissues. And that has an effect not just on humans, but on other organisms that are dependent on plants for their uh, foodstuffs. Would you say that that's the main challenge for this area, the I increase in CO2? The issue of climate change is, as we all understand, a very complex one. And, and you can't say there's one issue because there's many issues working in concert to have a large overall effect. So there's temperature issues like I raised, there are precipitation rainfall issues, uh, there's rising CO2 levels and declining food quality. All those things combine into saying that we have to address those issues uh, not only individually but together because they'll yes. have a confounding effect. And this is the trend nowadays for science to have more of an interdisciplinary approach to, uh, to some of the problems. Yeah, in fact, most people call it transdisciplinary. It's not just one or two things, but it, it, it's... Across the board. Across the board. Yes. And, and Frank, um, okay, can you tell us a little more comment on the challenges of conventional, uh, challenges of global warming, rather, on conventional uh, agriculture and sure. uh, in the world. Give us an overview in, in lay terms, if sure. you could. <laughs> Lynn, Lynn, we thought uh, some time ago that uh, conventional agriculture in the de more development or the more the developed world would be more um, um, protected. Uh, but because we can use certain technologies in order to shield off weather extremes. But we have found that indeed that's not the case. In fact, when you look at a place like California, we find that some of the greatest challenges of animal agriculture are directly linked to um, a shortage of water or um, heat events. Um, shortage of water not necessarily because we can't provide water to our animals, mm -hmm. but because we can't grow the feed for our animals the way we used to. Uh, the drought is really, really affecting animal agriculture and it leads to increased prices mm -hmm. and the increased prices of feed uh, directly affect the bottom line of producers. Mm -hmm. so, much, uh, so much so that approximately 5% of our dairy farms in the state have already gone bank bankrupt. Mm -hmm. So, and this is California yes. where we really have the resources to deal with a lot of issues. Yes. Uh, in the developed world uh, we don't have these kind of uh, uh, resources available. And there, if there's a drought, uh, people will certainly lose um, the, likely, the livelihood of their, of their animals. They lose drinking water, they lose uh, water as a resource for their livestock and for the crops that these animals need. So um, any kind of weather extremes affect animal agriculture throughout the world. The developing countries are more vulnerable than the developed countries, but don't uh, fool yourself thinking mm -hmm. here in the, in the rich uh, developed world we are immune to it. We are not. That's a very good point. And of course, uh, Louise Jackson, you are, uh, uh, you're one of your specialties, of course, is, uh, is uh, water uh, resources. So um, uh, do you also see this as, uh, as uh, the primary uh, challenge for the future? In some of the research we've done looking at water and adaptation, it looks like we're going to have to diversify the crops that we grow. We're going to have to have sort of a different palette of crops 
of um, crops that are um, more drought adapted, um, be more aware of seasonal differences in precipitation and how that might affect the success of different crops. So water might be a, a, a trigger point for people thinking about how to diversify California agriculture. It's not that we have a lot of don't have a lot of commodities, it's just that they're kind of localized in certain mm -hmm. regions and we may end up diversifying those more. Another thing that we're working a lot on is how we can maintain soil fertility with renewable inputs mm -hmm. so that people don't have to rely so much on fossil fuel based inputs. For example, um, use of um, cover crops, of um, different kind of waste materials in soils to build up the microbial activity and the microbial populations. And in that way, people become more self-reliant mm -hmm. and they're not so vulnerable to price fluctuations. That's so very interesting. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Of course, that uh, will have a huge impact on uh, livestock because mm -hmm. if the feed is more resilient, more abundant, less costly, then uh, your, uh, your animals will be able to uh, to survive better in a way and cost. Would you say that? Mm -hmm. I, I would, yes. Yeah. Um, Let's, um, I'm very curious about uh, what you do <laughs> and I, I'm sure our community will also be uh, very interesting. So I was wondering if in uh, late terms you could, um, uh, you can tell us and I'll start with Arnold if you don't mind, how is your research related to uh, the uh, uh, climate smart agriculture and, uh, and how what do you hope to achieve with your research? Oh, oh, we've been looking at how plants get nutrients from the soil and convert that into part of their plant body and how rising CO2 levels uh, influence that process and found quite unexpectedly that uh, in fact uh, other people had it had not been reported before that that, uh, that part of that process was fairly well stopped by rising CO2 levels. Uh, one thing m most people don't realize that the CO2 levels that we have today, the carbon dioxide levels we have today, are higher than they've been for the last 23 million years. That's Fantastic. The, and so... Uh, all There's no going back. Yeah, the life that we know it evolved in for the last 22 million years under CO2 levels, carbon dioxide levels that are lower than they are today. And uh, this has a large effect on how plants it, and also animals uh, deal with their environment. So we're looking at what is uh, the cause of this and part of it is uh, most people had thought that plants waste a lot of their energy. Uh, they thought plants were dumb. In fact they're not dumb, it's just that we didn't fully understand them, if we do now, we don't fully understand them, and so they use part of uh, the energy they expend in a process uh, called photorespiration to convert uh, a low energy form of nitrogen into protein, which is a high energy form of nitrogen. And high carbon dioxide levels interfere with that conversion. And so, in fact, it explains why uh, food quality may be declining somewhat, and also explains why Insects, uh, for example, have to eat more food to meet their nutritional needs. That's very interesting. And in fact, we may have to feed our cows more food because of the protein levels are declining. So it does intersect. Uh, all, everything we do intersects. That's why we're transdisciplinary. And, and this is why uh, you are working uh, marginally together mm -hmm. and uh, all the scientists around the world you keep in touch. I know you all very prominent and have uh, collaborations all over the world and uh, so you're hoping to have a uh, uh, a new approach to, to all these problems, perhaps not new but anyway uh, uh, I, th I think I can say new, wouldn't you say? A new approach. And uh, Frank, tell us a little bit about your research. How, what, how does it relate to, to this? I would say that I have three main areas of research. The one is dealing with heat stress in livestock. Mm -hmm. Finding how we can reduce heat stress in cattle and pigs and so on. And how we can help them to um, deal with weather extremes, with uh, heat events. That's one. The second one is that 
uh, I'm chairing a uh, global effort on benchmarking, that's what it's called, mm -hmm. quantifying mm -hmm. uh, the environmental impact of livestock, particularly uh, quantifying the carbon uh, footprint of livestock. Yeah. And um, as I said, I'm chairing a global effort on this, uh, on this issue, but also I do research here in Davis using what people refer to as bovine bubbles, <laughs> large structures, they look yeah. like very yeah. large bubbles yes. and you can put up to 10 cattle into each. Yes. Um, and then I measure basically the greenhouse gases that are belched out by cattle uh, or that uh, arise from animal manure and uh, quantify those emissions. And thirdly, I look in, uh, into ways to reduce those greenhouse gases, both from animals and from the manure, but also from feed the feed that the animals consume. That's very interesting. So would you say, and this is just a ballpark, would you say that animal livestock production uh, is more, contributes more gas emissions than say car airplanes and uh, trucks and things like that? Um, I would say that livestock is an important contributor to methane. Yes and which is a potent greenhouse gas, whereas transportation, cars, trucks, trains, planes and so on, uh, produce more CO2, carbon dioxide. So there are different greenhouse gases. Overall, the use of um, fossil fuels, which is associated with transportation, but yes. also with fertilizers and so on, yes. is the most prominent source, the most prominent source of greenhouse gases. Uh, but that being said, um, enteric fermentation, basically what happens in the rumen, in the first stomach of a cow or a steer or so, also contributes to large amounts of methane. And we have found ways and we will find ways to further curb those emissions. That sounds very interesting. Louise, would you like to tell us a little more? I know you've mm -hmm. touched on, uh, on some of the, uh, the, the, the research that you are um, uh, at the moment involved with, but can you tell me really what do you see as your major contribution to, to climate uh, uh, smart agriculture. We're trying to understand how people can um, grow crops, especially um, vegetable crops, with less inputs, less water, less fossil fuel um, based um, inputs. Um, I mentioned that before, but another thing we've been involved in here in Yolo County is um, a large um, analysis of how Yolo County will um, adapt to climate change. and. We um, had on board the Ag Commissioner, the, the Farm Bureau, uh, many different stakeholders in the county. And um, people were very involved in thinking of different kinds of solutions. And um, some of the things that arose from that study is, um, first of all, that only about half the farmers and ranchers here actually believe that the climate's changing, which is important because that means that they may not be focused on solutions. That's very interesting. Uh, well, um, uh, you've sort of introduced my next questions uh, and that is, and I'm going to start with Frank, uh, what do you think it's, uh, do, you, do you think uh, the major challenges and taboos uh, that uh, uh, you need to overcome uh, with uh, this uh, uh, global climate, smart agriculture. Well, what troubles me is that those people who provide us with food, namely farmers, are generally defensive when it comes to discussions about impacts of human activities on climate change. Um, and I think that they are one of the largest providers of solutions to the issue and should be on board and should be enthusiastically on board. Uh, because not just do they provide for our food, but they can also do so while minimizing impacts. And um, there are so many low-hanging fruit, no pun intended, low-hanging fruit that farmers can use uh, to all of our benefit. Mm -hmm. uh, make us as a society feel good about the wonderful food we eat and uh, doing so in a sustainable manner. And I think farmers really need to come on board. Many of them are not, and I think they should. That's something that uh, I'm sure you're working on. Yes. And uh, what about uh, Arnold? Uh, what is the major challenge? Uh, uh, just uh, in a sentence or two, as you, we are winding down, because uh, we are getting towards the end of our interview, but I do want to hear uh, the, about what you think is the main channel and challenge. Well, I think. I'd like to emphasize I teach a very large class of undergraduates on climate change and 
Um, the point I always like to make to them is that uh, the more I teach about it, the more optimistic I get. That there's oh, but that's wonderful. Uh, that there are many things we can do that are not, do not require great sacrifice that can have a, a significant effect on our, our uh, planet and on our effect on uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And therefore, we'd like to uh, uh, get them involved, and we have, uh, and I think that can be done with all sorts of the populace. The idea is that uh, we can all benefit from very simple actions, and we just have to make that clear to them what they are and how that can be of benefit without great. Well, this is this is very uh, reassuring and uh, uh, encouraging. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are uh, just about out of time. So what I would like to say is thank you very much for coming and for sharing your thoughts and expertise uh, with us. And uh, uh, Professor Arnold Bloom of the Department of Plant Sciences, uh, Professor and Extension Specialist Louise Jackson of the Department of Water, uh, uh, Land, Air and Water Resources and Professor uh, Frank Mitlone of the Department of uh, Plant uh, Animal Sciences and of course all of you watching at home. Thank you very much. Now if you'd like more information about uh, climate, uh, the climate and especially um, uh, the um, uh, the uh, uh, climate uh, uh, the, the global UC Davis is sponsoring, I should have mentioned this earlier, I'm sorry, but UC Davis uh, is sponsoring a global uh, climate to smart agricultural comp comp uh, conference and um, uh, these uh, uh, scientists have been uh, involved and I wanted to say that uh, one of the uh, sessions the, uh, is uh, on uh, March 20th and at just at the beginning of the conference will be um, free and open to the public so I hope you'll be able to go and uh, so we are really out of time so um, I would like to uh, thank all of you for watching and I'm your host Lynn Weaver you've been watching in the studio and uh, if you'd like to watch this program again you can log on on to our website davismedia.org and while you're there you can check some of our other programs and uh, archives so you've been um, thank you very much again for watching and uh, see you next time